Everybody had seen this. There was no denying at this time. There's something going on. I don't think I've ever been so terrified in my life. I called back my new doctor, Dr. Huggins, told them that I wanted an appointment for that day. And the nurses asked, what's the nature of the visit? And I said, I want to know why I can't breathe, and I want to know now. When he walked into the office, he appeared somewhat frustrated due to the fact that his symptoms had worsened. She took it seriously. She listened to what I said, and she responded. I decided to go on to, to order a chest x-ray, primarily to make sure that there was nothing else there that we might be missing. But then, Dr. Huggins decided to order one more test. What she wanted to do was to rule out this rare genetic disease that she just knew that I didn't have. I don't really recall if she even told me what the name of the disease was. Len didn't give the test a second thought, but two weeks later, he was surprised by a phone call. I was standing in my kitchen, um, wearing a suit, and it was Dr. Huggins on the telephone. And uh, she called to let me know that the results had come in from my test. And then Len heard the words that would change his life forever. It turned out that that rare genetic lung disease that she was ruling out was my actual diagnosis. And it was, a, it was a complicated name. It was very difficult for me to call him and let him know that he did indeed have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, or genetic emphysema, is a potentially fatal disorder in which the body doesn't produce enough alpha-1 antitrypsin protein. When the lungs do not have enough of this protein, enzymes destroy the lung tissue, making it difficult for the person to breathe. While fewer than 10,000 Americans have been diagnosed with the disease, doctors believe the occurrence is much higher. Left untreated, Len's lungs would eventually shut down, and he would die. He was sad. We may even have exchanged a tear or two. Being told that, um, that you're not going to live a normal life, being told that you're not going to live a normal lifespan, uh, yeah, I thought I was going to live forever. That was my plan. Hoping to reverse Len's downward spiral, Dr. Huggins referred him to a pulmonologist, Dr. Robert Schreiner. I remember walking into the exam room and seeing a physically fit, tan uh, man about my age who had the appearance of someone who was perfectly healthy. And that was very different from the man that I was reading about in his chart. Uh, the man in the chart was uh, very ill. In an attempt to slow the progression of the disease, Dr. Schreiner put Len on a weekly dose of the protein he was missing. But everyone knew that the only way Len could avoid a slow death by suffocation would be a double lung transplant. And the odds of finding a match were slim. There's no doubt that the clock was ticking in Len's case. There have been uh, times where patients passed away while waiting for their lung transplant to arrive. I didn't have my health. I had lost my family. I'd gone through a divorce. Everything that I had defined myself by, what I thought people defined me by, I didn't have anymore. After being diagnosed with a fatal lung disease, the only thing that can save Len Geiger's life is a double lung transplant. He is on a transplant list, but every day he waits brings him closer to death's door. Len didn't have much time left. He was, he was close to this disease taking his lot. I became depressed uh, to the point where I, I was on antidepressants for a while, and we were honestly fearing for my life at that time. He couldn't turn over with oxygen in the bed without being short of breath. He couldn't talk and breathe at the same time, hardly. Uh, we knew that time was running out. Then in 2001, with the clock ticking down, Len received a phone call he will never forget. The woman on the other line explained that she was a, a transplant nurse from the University of Virginia, and that they thought that they had a pair of lungs for me and wanted to make sure that I was well enough to do this. 
And I said, can you give me a moment? And she said, yeah, take a minute. And I thought and said, you know, these last six months have hardly been worth living. Yeah, I'm ready. I called my parents, said, pack a bag, it's time, let's go. Racing to the hospital, Lynn knew that this transplant was his last chance for survival. The next thing I knew, I was in an operating room and the anesthesiologist looked down at me and he said, are you ready? And I said, let's do it. And everything went black. A double lung transplant is extremely risky. There's a chance that the body might reject the donor lungs, causing death. But for Len, there was no other choice. All his family could do was hope and pray he would make it. When I woke up, um, I was very, very happy because waking up alive was my number one priority. I was on a ventilator. There was a machine breathing for me, the tubes down my throat. I couldn't talk because they went past my vocal cords, so you can't speak. He was in intensive care at that point, and uh, hooked up to so many things you wouldn't believe. But he was there, and he was alive, and his color looked good. And he was smiling. The transplant was a success. Within about four days or so, I was breathing completely on my own. Within two months of my transplant, um, this was the middle of summer, 2002, I had taken up mountain biking. This was just amazing for me. I, I, when I, I couldn't have walked before, and now I was racing on a, on a mountain bike, pedaling my butt off. And there were times when I wondered if I had actually died during the transplant, and this was heaven. A big determinant of how well patients will do after lung transplantation is how closely matched the donor lung is to the recipient's own immune system. And thankfully, Len received uh, donor lungs um, that were very closely matched to his own immune system. About a year and a half after my transplant, I was lucky enough to meet the family of my lung donor. And it turned out that she was a 14 and a half year old girl. I carry a photograph of her around with me and look at her and keeps me, I think, well grounded. After years of struggle, Len has finally gotten a second chance at life and his future looks bright. If he avoids unusual infections or avoids, more importantly, rejection, he could live a full, long, robust, healthy life till his 70s, 80s, or who knows? I feel absolutely phenomenal right now. Everything in my life has turned around. I don't think I could be any happier. I don't think I'll ever be able to take the ability to breathe for granted. It's sweet air.